Welcome to Dharma Rim Buddhist University's symposium lecture, A Buddhist Response to a World in Crisis. We are delighted you can join us today to listen to our honored, honored guest, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. My name is Jin Xiang. I am a member of the symposium committee at DRBU. I'll be helping to facilitate today's event. To get started, we invite everyone to introduce themselves by typing in the chat box your name and where you are joining us from. A special welcome to those of you who are new to DRBU. We request that everyone keep their mics on mute throughout the talk. There will be a chance to ask our, our speaker questions at the end of his talk. Namarin Buddhist University is a small liberal arts college in North Northern California. We offer uh, a BA in liberal arts based in great books of East and West an MA in Buddhist classics, as well as a graduate certificate in Buddhist translation. For more information about these programs, please visit our, our website at www.drbu.edu. The DRBU Symposium has been hosting academic lectures and workshops since 2015. Many of our talks are held in person on our, our campus. In recent years, we've added online lectures as well. The symposium aims to host lectures that complement the curriculum of our academic programs while bringing wisdom and insight to contemporary issues. To begin, we invite Dharma Master Han Yin to introduce today's speaker, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and happy Mother's Day to the mothers out there. Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi has devoted a lifetime to study, practice, and service. After completing his PhD in philosophy, he traveled to Sri Lanka, where he received novice ordination and bhikkhu ordination, both under the eminent scholar monk, Venerable Balangoda Ananda Maitreya. A monk for some 50 years, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi has many important publications to his credit, including a translation of the entire Anguttara Nikaya entitled The Numerical Discourses of the Buddha. Most recently, he published his Reading the Buddha's Discourses in Pali, a practical guide to the language of the ancient Buddhist canon. In 2008, together with several of his students, Venerable Bodhi founded Buddhist Global Relief a nonprofit supporting hunger relief, sustainable agriculture, and education in countries suffering from chronic poverty and malnutrition. Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi has offered several series of courses for Dharma Realm Buddhist University and the City of 10,000 Buddhas, including a seminar called The Path of Liberation and a series on Abhidhamma. He has also been a guest speaker multiple times in our Buddhist text translation certificate program. He is a personal hero for many of us, someone who is simultaneously a Buddhist monk, scholar, translator, and last but not least, an activist. He uses his Buddhist practice and knowledge to envision and, en envision and enact wise and compassionate responses to the massive ecological, social, and humanitarian crises we face today. With joy and respect, we now invite Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi to share his thoughts with us on the topic of Buddhist response to a world in crisis. Venerable Bodhi. Okay, so first let me thank the Dharma Realm Buddhist University for inviting me to give this talk uh, this afternoon and to Venerable Hung Yin for the in introduction. Oh, it's hard to believe that I've spent 50 years as a monk. <laughs> when you said it, I realized I did a little arithmetic in my mind and realized that I had my novice ordination in 1972. Though I still have about six months to go until I actually reach the actual date of the ordination, the novice ordination. Okay, so the topic that I was asked to speak about, it's quite a, an intimidating one and quite a momentous one. And so in a talk of roughly one hour, I'm supposed to provide the solutions to all of the overwhelming 
crises and conflicts and problems facing humanity today. So what are some of these problems that we're facing? So I'll just enumerate several of them, not in a particular order. One is that we have glaring income inequality, both within the United States and between countries around the world, as well as the persistence of poverty, even larger and larger percentages of the world's population are facing the threat of debilitating poverty, hunger, lands becoming inhospitable to human habitation. And then in this country, we have the persistent problem of racism, which is now sort of surfacing in new forms, forms which I would say are now even threatening the viability of our democratic political system. We have continuing militarism. We have lavish expenditures on a military budget at the same time diminishing or diminished comparatively smaller investments in programs of social welfare, social uplift. And we have repeated incidents of police violence, particularly against Black Americans, but also against other people. Um, we have an upsurge of religious fundamentalism, a kind of very toxic, I would say, brand of Christian radical fundamentalism, which is even threatening to erode the foundations of democracy in this country, growing intolerance and polarization between people of different convictions, different political convictions. And then sort of as the dark cloud overshadowing all of our conflicts, we have environmental destruction, particularly manifest in the form of was called climate change, but I prefer to call it the climate crisis or climate devastation. Okay, now I was asked to deal with these topics by re basing my talk on primary sources. And I think this is, I was given that assignment because that is the approach taken at the Dharma Realm Buddhist University to study topics by going to primary sources. And that puts me in a kind of quandary, because if we turn to the ancient Buddha sources, we don't find a large amount of literature on those particular problems. But we do find some indications or hints in classical Buddha sources on a kind of, let's say, a, a vision of an ideal social and political order and actually very concrete and specific instructions or guidelines lay down for rulers on how to administer their country. And so what I'm going to do is to go through some of these primary sources, first taking the ancient primary sources, and then also taking what we would call contemporary primary sources, some documents from the modern era, which lay down, call us the paradigm for a proper, benevolent, beneficial, economic and social order that is conducive to the common good. So we'll look at those documents, and then I will develop my own thought and my own analysis based on those sources. So what I'm going to do is to share my screen. And so we can look at the documents together. It's okay, this is what I want. Okay, please let me know if you can see the screen and whether the type is large enough. Um, we're seeing your file folder. Um, oh, I see. I have to. Oh, you have to reshare. Okay. There is, we it is it visible now? Yes. Okay. Okay, so first I take some text from the Pali sources 
on political administration. And of course, in the Buddha's time, the primary model of political administration was that of the monarchy. And so the Buddha lays down some guidelines for the king, the role of the king in relation to his, to the nation over which he's ruling. And the primary emphasis is not so much on specific policies, but the king should be himself a model of moral conduct and should inspire others to follow moral conduct. And so the word that's used to describe the proper king is a dhammika raja, a king who rules in accordance with dhamma, taking the word dhamma not in the narrow specific sense of the Buddha's teaching, but in the broader sense of a basic principle of righteousness, goodness, and truth, which is seen as the foundation for human flourishing. And so the king, as the head of state, has a very significant impact upon the entire country over which he rules. So when kings are unrighteous, when they act contrary to the Dhamma, that influence spreads down through all of the different levels of the society, and not only down to the different levels of different cl social classes of human beings, but it even affects the natural order, the impersonal order of the cosmos, so that the sun and moon, constellations and stars and so forth, proceed off course, the seasons and years go off course, the winds blow at random, the deities become upset, and there's lack of rainfall. And then the crops, there are crop failures, the quality of the food is poor, and people become short-lived, weak, and sickly. In contrast, when kings are righteous, everything proceeds in accordance with the correct order, even the correct cosmic order, so that the sun and moon and so forth um, follow the proper orbits, and then the crops ripen properly, and food quality is good, and people become long-lived, beautiful, strong, and healthy. And even though this is cast in a somewhat myth mythological type of language, but if we transpose this into modern conditions, we could see that there's some degree of truth in this. Okay, then the ideal ruler, according to the Buddhist discourses, is called the wheel-turning monarch, the Raja Chakavati, who governs his realm not according to his own arbitrary whims, not according to his personal ambitions, but he must rule the kingdom by relying on the Dharma. Again, Dharma in the sense of that impersonal universal law of justice, goodness, and truth. And based on the Dharma, the king will provide lawful, that's Dhammika protection for everyone in his realm not only human beings, but even the beasts, the animals, and the birds. Okay, then there's a sutta, which, and this is a, partic a text that has particular relevance to some of the points I will be bringing up later. So in this sutta, a prince, has come to his father. His father is a whale-turning monarch. And the prince cannot automatically become, when the prince succeeds to the head of to become head of state, he doesn't automatically become a wheel-turning monarch, but he has to earn that status by ruling in accordance with the Dharma. So we have the first piece of instruction is the same as in the other sutta that we looked at. But here we have some specific articles of advice. And one of the important ones that will be especially relevant to us is that the king should ensure that there is no poverty in his realm and he must give wealth to those in need. In other words, he must take measures to ensure that everyone in his realm enjoys a satisfactory standard of living. 
And when he wants advice about how to rule the kingdom, he's to go to wise ascetics and Brahmins and ask for their advice. And it's presumed that they will be able to teach him what is good, what is bad, what is harmful, and what is beneficial. So that is the duty of the wheel-turning monarch. And then there's another sutta that also gives instruction in somewhat the same spirit. This is in the Diga Nikaya, sutta number five. So here, the realm of this king was beset by lawlessness and bandits were attacking the countryside. And so the king turns to his chaplain for advice. And the chaplain is actually the bodhisattva, the future Buddha in an earlier life. And then the chaplain tells the king that you might think that you can get rid of this plague of robbers by means of execution and imprisonment. In other words, by imposing in contemporary terminology, stronger measures of law and order, beef up the police force, send the army out to the countryside to eliminate the bandits, execute them, and that way your troubles will be over. But the chaplain says that is not the correct approach to take. That will just create hatred in the citizens and bring more uprising, more rebels. But this is the way to eliminate the crime wave. So to those engaged in agriculture, give grain and fodder. To those in trade, give capital so that they could initiate their business enterprises, their activities. And to those in government service, pay proper living wages. In other words, again, this is the application of that principle, eliminate poverty, ensure that everybody has a satisfactory standard of living. That is the responsible responsibility of the government. The government has the task of ensuring that all of the citizens can meet their, their basic economic needs and conduct their livelihoods successfully. That is part of the responsibility of the state. And so in that way, when this takes, when you take these measures, the people will not harm the kingdom, the land will be tranquil and not be beset by these thieves. And then the people will, will be joyful in their hearts and will dwell in open houses playing with their children. Okay, there's a list of some 10 royal virtues. I won't go over all of them, but we can see that the king is expected to exemplify such qualities as generos generosity, morality, gentleness, non-anger, non-violence, and should respect the opinions of others, avoiding bias and promoting peace and order. Okay, so these are some passages from the early Buddhist texts. And now we want to see how these might have been exemplified in Buddha's history. So again, I'm turning to another set of primary documents. And these are some of the edicts or selections from the edicts of King Ashoka. King Ashoka was a king in India in the third century before the common era, who was himself embraced Buddhism. And he had extended the range of his rule over pretty much the greater part of Northern and Central India. And since he had a kingdom consisting of people following different dharmas, different teachings, not only Buddhism, he had to rule in a way that promoted the well being of, that promoted religious and communal harmony, while in his own personal life, he lived in accordance with the Buddha's Dharma. And so he uses the word Dharma in his edicts, not again, not in the narrow sense of Buddhism as such, but in the sense of 
the common core of the way he sees it of all religious and ethical teachings. And so he says that he refers to his, himself as King Piyadasi or Priyadashi. He promotes restraint in the killing of harming of living beings, proper relatives towards uh, proper behavior towards relatives, Brahmins and ascetics, respect for parents and elders, and so forth. And he created a system of Dharma ministers that he sent out over his realm to teach, to inculcate the observance of ethical principles among all segments of his population. And so he says that these Dharma ministers work among all religions for the establishment of Dharma, for the promotion of Dharma, for the welfare and happiness of all who are devoted to Dharma. And then he speaks about his own con his conception of his own duty, his own obligation as a king is to rule for the welfare of all. And he says, there's no better work than promoting the welfare of all the people. And whatever efforts I am making is to repay the debt that I owe to all beings to ensure their happiness in this life and to show them the way to heaven in the next life. And his conception in this edict, he indicates his conception of Dhamma, that Dhamma consists of proper behavior towards servants and employees, respect for parents, generosity to friends, and not killing living beings. And he even makes provision, for, he says, I make provision for two types of medical treatment. So he establishes hospitals for human beings and also hospitals for animals and provides, obtains the herbs he needs, the medicinal herbs that he needs, both for human beings and for animals, even importing them from other lands if they're not available in India. Again, he explains his understanding of Dharma. It includes abstaining from evil, practicing goodness, kindness, generosity, truthfulness, and purity. Okay, so these are just some examples from the, the sayings or the edicts of King Ashoka as a way in which a Buddhist king try to embody the principles or to use the principles of Dharma as a guideline for administering his realm. And then coming several centuries later, we have a work that's ascribed to the famous Mahayana Buddhist philosopher, Nagarjuna. The work is called the Ratnavali or the Precious Garland. Okay, so Nagarjuna says that you should win over the world. He, this text, the precious garland, was written according to tradition by Nagarjuna addressed to a king, a king who was ruling over South India at that time. And so he instructs the king that you should win over the world by means of Dharma. And by this, he indicates by giving, by gentle speech, by benevolent action, by collaboration, and by way of, these are the four bases in Buddhism of attracting the retinue, of winning the loyalty of others. And then the king should base himself on these four principles of goodness, truth, generosity, peace, and wisdom. But Nagarjuna, then goes on to enumerate some more specific types of guidelines to policy that the king should follow in order to acquire as a, seeing the king as an aspiring bodhisattva to acquire the 32 marks of a Buddha. 
So he should give abundant food and drink. He should never do harm and should free the condemned. He should reconcile friends who have been divided, give homes to the homeless, um, care, again, care for the sick, speak true and soft words. He should serve others and view beings with love without desire, hatred, and delusion. And then to collect the requisites of enlightenment, the king should establish schools and provide for the salary of school teachers, should establish hostels, parks, so forth, care for the sick, orphans, and widows, the lowly and the poor, make various medicines freely available. Here we have a kind of Medicare for all policy, named, at least advocated in ancient India, provide care for the victims of crop failure to ensure everybody has sufficient food, reduce the tax rate, provide farmers with the seeds that they need with land and so on. Well, this might not go over well today. <laughs> Give to those in need beautiful girls well adorned. Um, provide facilities for studying the Dharma and then to cause good qualities to grow in others. And then especially to inspire in himself and in others, the altruistic aspiration to enlightenment. Okay, so this is a broad overview of some ancient primary sources. And now I want to take a, some contemporary sources. Okay, so we could see from the canonical Buddhist texts, as well as from the example of King Ashoka, the edicts of Ashoka, the advice of Nagarjuna, that basically ancient Buddhism advocates the creation of something that we would call a true welfare state. Nowadays, the term welfare state has gotten a rather bad name because of the dominance of... Um, not the screen anymore. It's the what comes before the screen that's up now. Okay. Yeah, this has always been a problem for me. <laughs> Okay. No. Is it visible now? Not yet. No. Not yet. I think you need to open it and then share it on Monday. Okay. Okay. You can stop share first. Still not there. Okay, now probably it's not. Here, let, let's try this again. It, um, is it open on your computer? Okay, is, is it visible now? Yes. US National Archives and Records. Okay, so I was yes. saying that from the, these ancient primary sources, we could say that the Buddhist ideal of government as, rep as represented by a monarchy is a welfare state. It's a state in which the ruler, in this case, the king, has the responsibility of ensuring the welfare of the population, both the material and the moral and the spiritual welfare of the population by serving as a model of righteous conduct himself, but also by taking specific measures to promote even the material 
intellectual and spiritual well-being of the population of the citizens of that state. Okay, now we come to a modern document, and this is the preamble to the US Constitution. And so here we can read that we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and then I highlighted this, and promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and posterity. So in the modern era with the establishment of the United States, we no longer have a monarchy. And so there's not a king to ensure the general welfare, but it becomes the responsibility of the people of the United States through their government to promote the general welfare. So that is an extremely critical point, I think, in understanding the way government should function. And this, I would say, provides a litmus test against which we can rate the, maybe the validity or the legitimacy of any government, whether it's truly working to promote the general welfare and to secure the blessings of liberty to us and to those who will come after. And that is the fundamental purpose of the Constitution. Okay, then we come several centuries later to a statement of, this is Franklin Delano Roosevelt established four freedoms, this freedom of speech and expression, freedom of religion, but what we have here, the third is the one that's relevant to our inquiry today, freedom from want. And that means a healthy, peaceful, peacetime life for all inhabitants. And I think Franklin Delano Roosevelt and later elaborated that into a code of economic well-being for all the citizens. And that to some extent is embedded within the universal, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was largely drafted, or at least the intellectual input to this Declaration of Human Rights came from the wife of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt. So Article 25 says that everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself or herself, including food, sufficient food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and other necessary social services. Then Article 26, everyone has the right to an education, a free education, at least in the elementary and fundamental stages. And the education should be directed to the full development of the human personality not just learning what is necessary to be able to get a job within the industrial complex, but the education should aim to promote the full development of the human personality, strengthening respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. Okay, another contemporary, most recent set of documents the primary document showing the goal or the ideal for social development are the 17 sustainable development goals posited by the United Nations. And these include, I highlighted just a few that are extremely critical. I mean, all of them are important, but several of these will be relevant to the my talk as I develop it. One is to eliminate poverty, to eliminate hunger so that nobody in this, the world's population has to go hunger. Today, there is something like 850 billion people, I'm sorry, 750 million people who face chronic hunger and malnutrition to promote good health and well-being of all, to ensure that everyone gets a quality education, to promote gender equality, reduce, I guess this would be economic inequality, 
and to take action to preserve a livable environment, especially to, to tackle the escalating problem of climate change. Okay, so, so these will show some of the goals towards which we should be aspiring as both a within this country itself and also as a global community. And I found a beautiful visual model which represents very clearly in a very memorable image, visual image, the kind of ideals towards which we should be aspiring in social and economic policy. This was developed by a British economist called Kate Raworth, and she calls it donut economics because she uses the image of a donut to show the kind of ideal towards which we should be aspiring. The donut has two circles, an outer circle and an inner circle. So the inner circle of the donut, the inner um, rim of the donut represents the social foundation, which constitutes the just space for humanity. So these are the fundamental material and social needs that must be met for every person in this world so that everybody is insured of adequate food, clean water, a satisfactory standard of living, education, a voice in the affairs of their own nation, a political voice, a job paying an adequate salary, clean sources of energy, social equity, gender equality, good health. So those are a number of basic parameters that define a healthy, vibrant, social, and economic order. But the outer rim of the donut shows the what she calls the environmental ceiling. These are the boundaries that we cannot overshoot without creating havoc for the resilience of this planet Earth, for the ability of this planet to sustain human civilization. And that the, the things we have to avoid are escalating climate change. I'll just mention a few acid, the acidification of the ocean, the shortages of fresh water, drastic land clearance, which should, leads to biodiversity loss and so forth. Yeah, chemical pollution. And so the way she formulates this, she says, what enables human beings to thrive? It's a world in which every person can lead their life with dignity, opportunity, and community within the means or limits of our life-giving planet. And so this donut points towards a future that can provide for every person's needs while safeguarding, safeguarding the living world on which we all depend. So we have the social foundation. Um, be below this lies shortfalls in human well being. And then we have the ecological ceiling. And then if we shoot beyond that, it puts pressure on the Earth's life, life giving systems. And so between these two boundaries, is the donut, which she calls the sweet spot that is both ecologically safe and the socially just space for humanity. And the task for us at this time is to bring all of humanity into that safe and just space. So why aren't we there? Why is it so difficult? There are so many clear thinkers who have looked at our social and economic system and have been able to see the defects, the faults, and propose new visions, new operating systems for the social and economic 
structures in which we live, but they're repeatedly, their visions are repeatedly rejected, denied, or not even attended to. And so that will lead me into the next part of my presentation. So let us close this. Okay, now I have to... Looks good. Okay, okay, so this was easy. <laughs> okay, so one of the major challenges that we face today is in fact, like this is a global challenge, and that is inequality and poverty. And I took down some statistics to show the extent of inequality and poverty. And some of these statistics are a bit shocking and even debilitating. So we have the distribution of the world's wealth. The top 1% owns 43% of the world's wealth. While the bottom 53%, that's half the world's population, owns a little bit more than 1% of the wealth. And though we might think that wealth is not a guarantee of happiness in its own right, but if one doesn't have at least an adequate income, an adequate amount of, of monetary holdings, one cannot live a satisfying life. And then the COVID pandemic has been called a great equalizer because everybody was supposed to be equally subject to COVID, but its economic impact has just exacerbated global inequality. So overall, the working population through the impact of COVID has lost $3.5 trillion, while billionaires around the world have gained close to $4 trillion in the course of the pandemic. And in the United States, we have 42.5% of the wealth, that's getting close to 50% of the wealth, is owned by the top 1%. And these statistics actually come from, I think, 2017. So probably today, a much greater portion of the wealth is owned by the top 1%. Probably by now, it's gone beyond 50%. And you could see this comparing to other countries like Japan, where the top 1% owns just a little more, well, maybe close to 11% of the wealth. And so we could see that the US has been veering towards an immense social and economic crisis created by escalating levels of inequality. And so the US has the greatest degree of income inequality amongst the economically developed countries, the lowest government spending on social programs as percentage of GDP. I think Ashoka and Nagajana would be shocked at the way the US is spending so little on social programs. The result, some of the consequences of this, the lowest score on the material well-being of children, highest infant mortality rate, high homicide rate, and freely guns are so freely available, large prison population. But the highest military spending, higher than the next eight, I think what now it's nine countries combined. Yeah, the US defense spending for 2022 to 2031 will come to roughly $800 billion a year. And just to get some idea of what this amounts to, recently, President Biden 
had been promoting what he called the Build Back Better Bill, which over a 10 year period originally was to come to three and a half trillion dollars. That's $350 billion a year. That's even less than half of the military budget. But then through the pressure from other, from certain senators, even that amount had been reduced, cut in half to $175 billion a year. What is that, about one fifth of the military spending. And the Build Back Better bill didn't pass, it was knocked, knocked down. Okay, so what are some of the impacts of inequality? It says studies have been done, careful studies, and they show that more unequal countries have shorter lifespans, worse health indicators, higher levels of heart disease, diabetes, mental illness, more alcoholism and drug use, more crime, more family violence and broken homes, more higher levels of obesity, more teen pregnancies, whereas more equal countries have longer lifespans, better health, and higher levels of reported happiness. So he gets the countries which consistently have quite high levels of happiness, reported happiness, basically the North European countries, Finland, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and Switzerland. Now, the crucial point here that I want to make is that economic inequality and poverty are not inevitable. They don't arise through the working, the inevitable working, the impersonal working of the laws of nature, but they are the result of decisions, political decisions that have been made in the past and decisions that can be reversed to usher in greater equality and to support people in need, a strong safety net is essential, but just having more social programs is not sufficient as a final solution to the interwoven problems of poverty and inequality. What is necessary, I would say, are fundamental systemic transformations to create an economy, a social order, and a political system that works for all. That is to forge a new system that can promote the common good. Okay, I delineate here some, what I would call, detrimental features of the dominant system under which we live here in the United States, which basically are the parameters of corporate capitalism, the need to constantly grow, to expand, to gain larger markets, the emphasis on consumerism. In order for a company to grow, it has to increase demand by provoking desires, creating artificial wants, rather than fulfilling genuine needs. And then to produce more goods, to fulfill the imperative of consumerism, the economy must extract ever more of the earth's natural resources to produce goods, and then to discharge, discharge waste into the environment, overburdening the environment with pollution, with toxic substances, which are detrimental to our health. And it's the corporation, which is the primary institution within this economic system that is responsible for extraction and production and which creates demand in order to enhance profits. And then the corporations exercise political domination by using their wealth to gain a even a stranglehold over the political system and also to manipulate the mainstream media to suit their needs to promote their products through advertising and so forth. And not only that, but the media must also shape the opinions of their viewers in ways favorable to the sponsor's interests 
and even more in ways that are conducive to the persistence of this system of domination, the system of economic and political domination. Okay, so what underlies the working of the system is what I call an inversion of values, a distortion of values by which monetary values, market values, returns on investments, the increasing financialization of all domains of human life, that this has come to dominate and to replace genuine human values as the underlying matrix that governs our social and economic system. So the values that could contribute to the true enrichment, deepening and upliftment of human life, the values that can ensure a shared prosperity that could ensure that everybody flourishes together those values are pushed to the sidelines and replaced by these purely stark, naked, material market values. And so we have to understand, get to the roots of this inversion of values and find ways to return to a genuine code of life promoting, life enhancing, life enriching values. So here, what I've tried to do, based on some social analysts that I've read over the years, is to unearth and to sort of bring to the surface what we would might call the deep motive meta program behind our predicament, the source code that underlies this inversion of values. So there are different dimensions to this. One is a certain sort of metaphysical premise, which is the idea of personal atomism, the idea that each of us has a private personal self, which is a fundamental reality, the fundamental reality from which we look out upon the world from which we view other people, from which we view the natural world, the environment. And so we see things from the standpoint of this private self, but there can also be a merging of private selves into collective entities, groups that see their group interests as pitted against the interests of other groups leading to competition, even brutal competition, the demonization of others, that well, first the objectification of others, of other people, of other groups, then even the marginalization, demonization, exploitation of others and of the natural world. So that the natural world, which is alive, vibrant, the source of our own being, the sustenance of our own being becomes turned into an object of exploitation, of extraction and utilization, evaluated purely in terms of utilitarian value. Then comes the so-called ethical dimension of the standpoint, according to which, and this is a view dominant in classical economics, that rational behavior means seeking to maximize one's own private self-interest. And so this again is what puts one into a relationship of competition with others. I am struggling against others to maximize my self-interest or the interest of my group against other groups. And this 
leads to the commodification of nature, the exploitation or of other people, turning them into either workers or consumers, customers, or competitors in the marketplace. And then the application of this program leads to the quest for ever increasing returns on investment. So somebody who is fully bought into the system measures their own well-being against purely economic criteria. What is my income? What is my wealth? How can I continue to expand to increase my wealth? And so I would say that this is the kind of driving force behind all of the multi-millionaires and billionaires, the need to constantly devour more and more of the Earth's resources to exploit more and more people to increase their own holdings. And so the consequence of this is that all other domains of value get invaded and subjugated by market values. And so the result is the reckless exploitation of the Earth's ecosystems, the reduction of people to the status of consumers and workers, subject to manipulation over fear for their material security. And so when we're pitted against one another in this way, we fail to recognize our common interests. We fail to take the action necessary to replace this present system, which I would call a predatory system, with one that conduces to true equitable human flourishing, to the common good, the common welfare spoken about in the preamble to our constitution. So how do we go about developing an alternative model of social, of human social life? So to do this, we have to develop and promote what I would call an alternative meta program. And here I draw upon some insights and values from the Buddha Dharma, but I don't want to make these principles exclusive to Buddhists and say, this is what Buddhists have to offer. Since I think these principles could be shared by all people of a clean, a clear ethical convictions. Okay, first we have to get to the fundamental level by challenging that metaphysic of the individual atomistic self. So from the a Buddhist point of view, and even from the standpoint of contemporary system thinkers, the idea of that atomistic private self is a delusion. In reality, we are intrinsically, inseparably, interconnected and interdependent. Our very being exists in essential relationship with the natural environment. We are, in, sen in a sense, the natural environment blown forth in human form. We are dependent upon and inter interlinked with countless other people, countless other li living beings. In fact, with the entire intricate web of life with the entire cosmos, with all of its galaxies and galactic systems going back to the time of the Big Bang 13 billion years ago and beyond that. Okay, so this is the metaphysical perspective. From this follows a different ethic. The ethic is based on the recognition, the affirmation of our essential interconnectedness and this entails a sense of universal responsibility that through our thoughts, our attitudes, our actions, we have the capacity to influence everybody else and everything else, even a responsibility to contribute our utmost to the upliftment of the whole in whatever little way we can. And so we might not be able to achieve much by acting individually, but when we join with others, collaborate with others in pursuing shared aspirations, the aspiration for the common good, then we can have a significant impact 
a transformative impact on the systems in which our lives are entwined. Okay, then as a motivation to adopt this code of ethics, we have to sort of come to a clearer understanding of where do we find true happiness? And often I've wondered about these people, these multi-billionaires like Jeff Bezos, um, who are some of the others, the heads of some of these fossil fuel corporations, the CEOs of many of these powerful corporations, the heads of the arms manufacturers, the head of those corporations, with the head of the pharmaceutical corporations, with their salaries of $20 million a year, $50 million a year, with their vast wealth, are they really inwardly happy and peaceful? They've maximized their private self-interest through rational detached economic calculation, but are they really happy? And that is where I would put the question mark. And I would speculate that they are not truly happy, but are always in this kind of brute competition with each other to see who can come out on top. So true happiness, and here again, we would use a Buddhist perspective, but even a broader perspective, even a humanistic perspective, doesn't come just from maximizing one's holdings, one's wealth, but from participating in all the domains of true value, material, social, aesthetic, and spiritual. So at the human level, happiness depends on meaningful, fulfilling, uplifting relationships, on family relationships, on friendships, on collaboration and cooperation with others in working to promote the good of all. Happiness also depends on a sense of communion with nature, preserving and protect, that would require preserving and protecting our parks, forests, the deserts from clear cutting and mining, and this act at the transhuman level or transpersonal level, the ultimate happiness depends upon connecting with some transcendent reality, however we conceive it, whether in Buddhism, nirvana or Buddha nature, or in Hinduism, the true self, Christianity with God, however one conceives it. But what all religions have in common is the idea that human beings are not self-sufficient, but we exist in relationship to some transcendent reality. And that's where our ultimate, fulfill our ultimate fulfillment lies. And so some of the measures to be adopted to promote or to achieve this kind of happiness. So I list them here. It depends, of course, on material security, since that is the foundation of well being. But our lives acquire meaning to the extent that they are enriched by other types of value. This comes through respecting nature, having reverence for the earth, protecting other species rediscovering a sense of being embedded in the cosmos, even a sense of the, what I call the sacred nature of the cosmos. Creating social and economic systems that affirm human unity and equality, grounded in the ideal of shared prosperity and respect for the limits of the geophysical and biological systems in which human life is embedded. Then we need aesthetic and intellectual enjoyment, which depends on leisure, less work, longer paid vacations, more time to pursue one's aesthetic and intellectual interests. And then the ultimate fulfillment comes through the quest for the ultimate good that is cultivating deeper levels of spiritual experience 
aimed at realization of the supreme good um, as conceived by whatever spiritual path one, one follows. So here I didn't want to express it in a way that's narrowly constricted to Buddhism, but open to a follower of any spiritual tradition. Okay, maybe I'll just take a few more minutes just to enumerate some of the values that can guide us in pursuing this kind of social transformation. We can call this the Dharma of engagement critical to our time. First, I put discernment, which in a sense corresponds to right view, that is having a clear and deep understanding of the dysfunctional social and political forces at work in our own society and in the world at large. And this bit must be coupled with an uplifting vision of alternative systems conducive to the greater good, to social justice, shared prosperity, and ecological sustainability. And the vision should be extended horizontally to embrace all humanity across the planet, but vertically down to future generations. We have to be responsible for, for the later generations, not destroy the planet so that later generations, even those who are children, teenagers, young adults now have to deal with the catastrophe that we bequeath to them. Okay, then we need, the next value is a sense of solidarity, a recognition of the essential unity of all people, understanding that our differences are secondary to our essential unity and seeing other people as subjects of experience, as beings who by their very inherent nature are disposed to avoid suffering and to seek their well being. And through this recognition of the subjectivity of other people, this counters our tendency to objectify others, to treat them as mere means to our own fulfillment. Then some other values are love or loving kindness, the urge to promote the well being, safety, safety, and happiness of others, and compassion the urge, even the imperative to relieve the suffering of others, a commitment to justice, the quest to secure social, political, and legal justice based on the principle that all people should be treated fairly and be free to sh actively shape the institutions and policies that govern their lives, equity, based on the conviction that all people should receive an adequate share of the material requisites of life, decent healthcare, education, housing, food, good schools, um, perhaps even a basic universal living income and peace, promoting peaceful solutions to communal, national and global problems. And then what we need, and this is particularly essential, is courage, the willingness to act without fear or hesitancy on behalf of people near and distant, including future generations, and to stand up for the living planet. Okay, I wanted to leave some time for questions. And so maybe I will end this presentation here. And I see it's 4.39. Maybe can we take like a three minute break? <laughs> Looks like we have about 15 minutes for yeah. questions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we'd like to open the floor. I see a question from Sanju. I think there's some questions above that too, Reverend Hungshur, and there's somebody. How were the questions we handled? Um, we'll take them one by one and ask people um, to um, 
turn on their video and ask them uh, when they're called on or put them in the chat and we'll call on you. Um, is, is Reverend Hungshu um, present and uh, with a question? Yeah, I'm here, Sean, thank you. Um, <laughs> General Bunte, yeah. greetings from greetings. Australia. Where are you? I'm in Queensland. Uh, <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to say uh, your upcoming 50 years in robes is something that we celebrate. <laughs> that's, that's a tremendous accomplishment. And <laughs> it's a statement about the maturity of the Dharma in the West that we can host both uh, yourself and also Dharma Master Hung Chur uh, mm. for half a century of, of cultivation mm. of the Buddhist disciple. Um, thank you so much for that talk. Uh, as, as you were uh, outlining the traditional uh, statements from King Ashoka and the others, I, I couldn't help but tear up uh, thinking about how far we've come from yeah. what you would say would be just what the, the way a good heart would want everyone to live. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and just simply uh, your voice stating those basics is is like a balm. It's like a a, a medicine to the to a wounded heart. Um, I would. I just wanted to just to to say my appreciation for your uh, for your work and and your willingness to put your voice out with with those standards and say we really haven't forgotten those standards. They're, it's just that they're buried in misinformation and disinformation so much static that uh, it's easy to forget where yeah, we've been you. yeah yeah i wanted to suggest two areas for potential exploration that i think are uniquely ours as buddhists to contribute and and i don't want to, to get your thoughts on them today but i i would just love to have to hear what you would say about them at some point uh, to develop them and one is the question, uh, whose voice counts? Who, who do we take as the authority? And uh, what that might say about a Buddhist description of mature, grown-up masculinity and femininity. For who is, who is the, the mature adult male? And looking at the Buddha as a standard of kindness and wisdom together that you can be both kind and strong that i'd love to hear you know a, a down-to-earth uh, ordinary english description of what we could develop as a male adult mm -hmm. human being and an adult mm -hmm. female human being i think those standards are mm -hmm. are lost in the deluge of being hot and being eternally young and uh you know all, all of the, the 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 models that we hold up to emulate for young people, that'd be one. And the other one is the question of how much is enough? Is the, the disparity, the inequality of income and, and resources that you outlined so, so yeah. clearly. Um, when we have the four requisites, the idea that in the Buddhist Sangha, there's a way to thrive and flourish with a fewness of desires yeah. and having the four requisites, you know, clothes for the seasons, yeah. food yeah. and drink, uh, yeah. shelter and medicine, that to be able to say there is a traditional way that says humans do well when we meet these needs. Without them, we suffer, but with them, it's sufficient. You know, so if, if I'd love to hear your, you know, in, in real English, the, the way that uh, we could outline a new standard for, for what's enough. Okay, that's enough for me. Thank you again for a wonderful talk. Yeah, okay. I wouldn't try to... I was I expected to answer those questions here? I would hope I, that if, if there was a way for you to develop those at some point in the future, I would love yeah, to read your thoughts. It would be, especially the second is something that, I mean, I've thought about, and basically we, we're going to be forced into an econ what I would call an economy of sufficiency rather than an economy of continued expansion because we're already overshooting the life-sustaining capacities of the earth. And so we have to greatly decrease our concept, or we have to greatly revise our conception of what we need to be happy 
and we, we're going to have to re, we're going to be compelled. We don't really have a choice about it. Compelled to greatly decrease our standards of living, even amongst the general population, to come much closer to the standard of living of an ordinary monastic person, learning to be content with the basic material requisites of life, but finding deeper and higher fulfillment in other um, areas of, of, of human life. It, as I've mentioned in the talk, in human relationships, in aesthetic pursuits, and in spiritual, spiritual the spiritual quest, instead of just constantly expand, trying to expand, develop uh, materially our material resources. Thank you, Venerable. We invite everybody to uh, consider turning on your cameras and switching to gallery view for, for this Q&A. We have about 10 more minutes. Uh, I see questions from Sanju Baral. Please, Sanju. Hello. Um, so my question, Venerable, is about reconciling. And someone also raised the same question. So the question is, how do we reconcile the idea of self-reliance which we find in the Buddhist text, the idea of uh, taking yourself as a refuse, yeah. and not relying on anything else but yourself. Yeah. And the idea that you talked about of how um, we're all interconnected and yeah. we're all interdependent. Yeah. And so much of the social causes is about realizing that interdependence and helping each other out. Yeah. But there's also a sense of like finding that in yourself so are these two things kind of contradicting to one another or they're mm. pointing to two different areas of um, practice? Yeah, I would say closer to the second alternative, pointing to two different, two different areas. When the Buddha speaks about being self-reliant, first, it doesn't mean that one doesn't exist in relationship to others. In fact, the Buddha's I mean, teachings bring out so many different aspects of interdependence, interrelationship. But what he's, when he emphasizes self-reliance, he's doing that in, especially in relation to spiritual practice, particularly meditative practice, that you can't expect to gain enlightenment, liberation, just by sitting back and not doing the work and expecting others to do, <laughs> to do, to do the work on, on one's behalf. But you have to put forth the effort yourself. But even within that framework of you know, striving for liberation, when the Buddha established this, he actually he established the Sangha initially as a monastic order, but also maybe you could say the broader Sangha of the different communities that support and help each other. So he has also the ideal of Kalyana Mitrita, of yeah. spiritual friendship, so that he says, rely on good friends, on noble spiritual friends, and work together in a community to support one another, to encourage one another, to correct one another. So you could say that that aspect of interdependence, mutual support is pervades the Buddha's teaching at every level. Thank you. We have another question from Wenbo. Can we invite Wenbo to uh, turn on your audio and ask your question and or video? Hi, uh, hi everybody. Hi, Venerable Pico Bodhi. Um, I have a question about uh, uh, the King Ashoka's time. Uh, yeah. It is apparently a very nice time. Um, and uh, the system he established is, uh, is great. Um, I'm wondering, um, it, it is, uh, Maybe because it is uh, life is impermanent that uh, his kingdom uh, came and, and went away, uh, but uh, like a, still like a, what um, can we uh, like uh, adapt some of, can we adapt some of the stuff uh, it did in the past and uh, maybe uh, turn it to uh, to make it adjust to our uh, more than the NH, uh, that uh, uh, to make our society a, a better place. Uh, and uh, is what are, um, and uh, yeah, basically, what are the uh, causes that also um, that 
that is kingdom that went away. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, as for as for as for the reason why his his model of kingship did not continue among his successors, I am not sure of the reason for that, but I think it's pretty obvious that. the heirs to his rule did not continue his system of kingship. I'm, I'm not so well read on the historical account of that phase of ancient Indian history. And as far as how to apply some of the principles of King Ashoka's model of governance to our own time, that's pretty much what I was dealing with in my talk. So I think that's the, the, uh, that's the way I would understand how we should apply those principles to our own time. Thank you. Yeah. We have time for one or two more questions. I see Zuchen had a question. Zuchen, would you? Yeah, like that's to... also my bad. I have two. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Viku Bodhi, for your talk. Um, I really appreciate it because I previously I was working on the international development strategy in Africa. Mm. So, like, yeah, definitely a lot of issue around inequality, hunger, and the basic needs that I kind of met a bottleneck when I started. I don't know. So, I really appreciate your work that's, that has, you know, this development that's integrated with Buddhist teaching with those values. Um, I, so for this new meta alternative program you mentioned, you know, you said like one key is to understand the atomic, atomic self is an illusion. So I wonder, you know, but at the same time, if like everybody is kind of struggling for their own self, even this level of safety, you know, to have food to eat, to, you know, that it's kind of, no. On the so that then does that mean that you know there needs to be a total upgrade to the social welfare system first, but then that's going to cost a lot. You know who who's going to pay for it? So how do we how can that actually be realized? <laughs> you know this kind of opening this uh, more integration into you know this community rather than each for their own to even just to survive and then keep going down that road. Yeah, you know, when I said that, like one of the roots are, of our contemporary crises is this illusion of the ultimacy of the individual or private self. And that, that leads to ruthless, uh, ruthless competition with others. It doesn't entail that one doesn't look after oneself. One also has to look after oneself to establish a, satisfactory standard of material well-being and social well-being for oneself and one's own family. But what I would say is that there has to be when one's motivations for those actions are strong, obsessive, compelling greed, a kind of insatiable greed, that's where the problems arise. But if people recognize that we live essentially in community, and they will secure their own well-being, which is, of course, a requisite for being able to act effectively in the world. But also, they'll be concerned to ensure that, let's say, the material wealth of the society is shared fairly equitably, not necessarily equally, but equitably among others, so that nobody has to live in conditions of degrading poverty, confront dealing with struggling with homelessness, hunger, lack of medical care, lack of access to education, and so on. So it's quite possible, especially with the wealth in this country and in other, some of the other wealthier countries in the world, to establish much more equitable societies in which everybody is looked after and you know, so that everybody can flourish, at least to the degree that they put forth effort so some of the countries that I mentioned in which there's um, much more wider distribution of wealth have reportedly higher standards of happiness, higher levels of happiness. Um, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, Switzerland. I think that's all the time we have. Sadly, um, can I invite Jin Shangshi to deliver closing remarks?
Yes, uh, on behalf of DRBU and the symposium committee, I'd like to express our deep appreciation to, appreciation to Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi for taking the time to share his knowledge and insights with us today. And thank you to all who have joined us today for this special event. If you would like to learn about future events like this, we welcome you to visit the symposium website at drbu.edu slash symposium. Thank you all.